today we will be speaking with Makah Black Elk from Red Cloud Indian School. Good morning, good to be here. Um, so I am the executive director for Truth and Healing at Red Cloud Indian School. Red Cloud Indian School was a former boarding school and part of the vast system of boarding schools that uh, were implemented for the assimilation of native peoples. Uh, and we were one of those that were run by the Jesuits uh, starting in 1888. Uh, we are no longer a boarding school today that officially closed in 1980. Uh, but my role as executive director for Truth and Healing is to uh, help guide the institution and the community through what in other places is known as a truth and reconciliation process. Uh, and that means sort of facing our history as a boarding school and the impact it's had on our community and the work so far has been now almost two years. Uh, of course, pandemic um, put a, a hit on what we were able to do, but I think this work is going really well and uh, it's really important for the community that it's taking place. All right, so you've been serving in this position since 2020, correct? Yes. And since then, um, you know, I've, I've taken notice and uh, you've, You've also joined the board for the uh, the National Coalition for Boarding School Healing. Um, can you can you share with us a bit more about this growing network uh, of organizations who are getting involved in this this work of really trying to make sense of the boarding school period, trying to collect stories and and bring about healing? Yeah. So the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition has been around for some years now, like way prior to, to all of this, it's been in, 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 it's been doing this work for, I think over eight years now. Um, and I think recently there's definitely been an, an up, uh, a, a sort of growth and in interest in the boarding school period and in reckoning with that history. Um, but uh, that growth really has of course stemmed from uh, the, news last year, last summer out of Canada um, of uh, their sort of rediscovery, so to speak, of uh, unmarked graves that, ha that they sort of pepper across different boarding schools, both religious and non-religious, um, where students were buried uh, as part of the, uh, as part of that whole system and students who were at those schools and who were buried at those schools. Uh, when they were students um, and the, the graves that sort of exist across the span of time. Uh, so the rediscovery of that has sort of sparked one, a, a national conversation in Canada um, that probably is uh, at a peak um, since their own Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, where they, you know, spent, the government spent uh, five years delving into this history sort of intentionally gathering testimony and, and learning more about it. Um, and so that's reignited that conversation in Canada and it's sort of adjacently sparked the conversation here in the United States about its own boarding school history. Um, and I think a lot more people, a lot more organizations, certainly a lot more Catholic organizations, which is where I find myself doing a lot of this work, um, are really starting to reckon with that. Definitely. And so you started this work, or I mean, you may have probably started a bit earlier than your actual appointment to the position, but what has been the response to your work uh, at the school and in the community? The response has been really mixed. Um, you know, people are, were surprised uh, initially. I think, you know, Red Cloud still is a Catholic school today and people see it as you know, part of the, the, great, the wider Catholic church um, and were surprised um, that this was something this institution was willing to do, willing to engage in its history. The, the pervading feeling prior to that had been, you know, Red Cloud will, will never address its history um, or that's not something it's, it's been willing to do. So people were shocked that we were willing to do that uh, in a more intentional way. Um, there were people who uh, were welcoming of this work and who were happy that it was happening. 
there were people who were skeptical and who felt maybe it's it's not yet enough um, and that they would sort of wait until they saw the action um, as opposed to uh, sort of take take it for for what it was. Um, and there are people who are fearful. Um, I think especially our Lakota Catholic community um, were fearful of you know, this effort bringing up and sort of dredging up this, the, this historic memory that was negative and that they felt it might, um, you know, sort of reignite anger towards the Catholic church and the Catholic faith. And that's something that's very precious to them. Um, and so there was uh, fear amongst people too. So all of the feelings really ranged when we first announced that we were going to be doing this. So in your opinion, would you say that maybe some of this skepticism has been one of the, the biggest challenges to your work? I would say the skepticism and the fear have, have been the biggest challenges. Um, and it, and it's, it comes from these really two different, vastly different sources, right? Um, the skepticism primarily comes from people who, uh, native people in our community who already had a distrust and an anger toward the Catholic church, sort of the non-Catholic, uh, our non-Christian community, often often represented by the sort of uh, resurgent traditionalist amongst our community, um, who really are commonly, but not always, you know, um, sort of anti-Christian, um, and their skepticism um, certainly is a barrier, uh, and their anger is really well understandable, um, also very challenging to, to face and challenging to sort of uh, talk talk with. Um, but it's that's probably the most important uh, community to engage with. Um, I think it, when it comes to the truth and reconciliation effort, it's those who are the most angry who really need that truth telling. Um, and so while that's really hard for us as an institution to sort of face, um, it, it's the it's the part of the process that I think is the most important. Um, so yes, it's difficult, but necessary. Um, on the other end, a side of that spectrum, you know, again, I mentioned we have our Lakota Catholic community who's really afraid of doing this work and who right. um, really doesn't want to um, in, in different ways. Not, not all of them, of course, I, I can't really speak in either of these communities as, as monoliths. Um, there are people within who, you know, are, are uh, have different perspectives, but um, the fear of sort of uh, dredging up this history and, you know, reigniting anger um, comes from a place where people really feel um, concerned that their faith identity is going to be attacked um, and that they're going to, it's going to bring up these feelings of, of you know, Native people can't be Catholic. Um, and, uh, and they're not, those fears aren't unfounded. And, and some of those feelings have come up, right? Um, and so uh, that's also, I think, a, a barrier in a certain way because it means that our, our Native Catholic community um, is hesitant at times to, to engage in this um, whenever, when actually I think their voice really matters um, as well um, because all of these voices are part of the greater truth-telling process. Yeah, I think, I think you really sort of hit the nail on the head with that statement about uh, you know, Native Catholics being afraid for their, you know, that their faith might be attacked. Um, there are many uh, Native people who, even if they haven't fully healed, they, I think they may have reached a place where they're at least at peace with what, you know, maybe have taken place in their life or in their, in their parents' lives. Uh, but you don't have to go very far, uh, I think, in conversations and you know, in social media uh, environments, to see that anti-Catholic sentiment uh, among Native people is is palpable. It, you you can feel it, you can sense it. Um, there's no real concerted effort to hide it. So, what advice would you give to to Native Catholics, just like you and I? Uh, you know, how can we continue to be advocates, but at the same time? I, I guess, you know, maybe bridge builders or peacemakers, mm -hmm. because we, we love our faith, right? But 
we also understand that that real progress has to take place? Yeah, I think um, that's a really important question because I think Native Catholic people are paramount to this work of truth and healing um, because I think, you know, that's a very real question, a question that a lot of Native Catholics get. How, how can you be Native and Catholic given that history? How are you able to reconcile this history where it, the Catholic Church was a part and was a part of and an accomplice in this broader process of colonization? Um, how can you as a person, you know, rectify that in your own in your own self? And I think it's an important question for Native Catholics to actually provide a functional answer. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to be to to be questioned that and sort of and sort of say, oh, well, you know, for me it's okay, or for me it um, I've, I've done my personal healing. I think it's helpful in other people's healing, whether they're Catholic or not, or Christian or not, um, for Native Catholics to actually offer a, a real answer to that question, um, to say, what keeps me in this faith, you know, regardless of the history of the church towards Native peoples that in some places is negative, and the boarding school history is one example of that. Um, especially early on, right? Now, I think, I think one of the things that needs to happen with the boarding school history, and this is a little bit of, a, of, a, of an aside from the, the question, but, um, you know, we, we need to start thinking of the boarding school history also in, in all of its complexity. Um, it, it does really start to transition. Yes, early on, it was an incredibly um, uh, sort of explicit assimilative process um, that may have come with a, a lot of corporal punishment or physical abuse uh, of all types. Um, and that uh, its very clear goal was uh, eradication of, of native language and culture and spirituality. Um, but as time went on, the boarding schools slowly changed. And you can maybe even think of it in increments of, of 20 years, right? the first 20 years, and then the next 20 years, and then the third set of 20 years, as you get into the 1950s and 60s and 70s, those boarding schools really start to change, including the Catholic ones. And they start to not be as uh, less about assimilation and more about education, um, more about, um, uh, you know, truly doing the work of, of what schools are supposed to do uh, as we think of them today. Um, and they start to become more culturally responsive um, and more culturally sensitive. Um, and so the experience of borders changes across time. Um, and so it, we can't even really think of boarding school as this, as this monolith, um, especially as time goes on. Um, but, but certainly in the beginning, it's, it's a very clear uh, assimilative process that is detrimental and devastating. Um, but Native peoples, Native Catholic peoples, I think, are at the core of helping our Native communities heal um, because their commitment to the faith, their own ability to reconcile that, that history and their faith, um, whatever, you know, no matter, no matter what the stage that they are themselves in, in that process, um, it, it's, it help, it's helpful and important to start to um, help others uh, reconcile that for themselves, especially to see that that the faith might be a different thing from the history of the church um, and the history of the boarding schools in particular. That yes, those two things can exist at the same time, but that I, I always love pointing to um, the this article that I've shared countless times from that the theologian Brett Salkeld, um, who is from the Diocese of, of Regina in Canada, who wrote this very beautiful theological um, uh, piece of, of writing that, that said, you know, if we examine this boarding school history, if we examine this truth and reconciliation work from the, from the perspective of our faith, we can see that the Catholic Church should never have been involved in these in these boarding schools to begin with, um, and that, and that here's the theological reasons why we shouldn't have, and why our faith tells us that this was wrong, 
Um, and that it's okay for our faith to recognize that as a church, we've done bad things. Um, and that doesn't necessarily corrupt our faith, um, but it does actually provide us with wisdom in terms of, and, and, I, and I think a reassurance of our faith and our, and our beliefs in our faith. And so I think that's a really also helpful lens for Native Catholics and for non-Native Catholic, or non-Catholic Natives um, to uh, try and, and make sense of this history and still make sense of Native people being able to have this faith. I think you've made some really good points there. Um, but, you know, one thing, one, you know, trait of the Catholic faith is that it's, it's sacramental. Um, we look for the tangible sort of things we can feel, touch, taste, and smell um, that remind us of, of, of our creator, of the divine. And so with that sort of approach to faith, it's very easy to have a faith that is almost inseparable from the institutional church, from the, the physical, you know, personal structures. So I think for, for many Native Catholics, uh, they might have to go through some sort of deconstructive process where they can sort of come to terms with the fact that, yeah, there were some bad actors who, who did very um, horrendous things on behalf of the church. But at the same time, that's not Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. That's not... That's not what his mission was. That's not why he, you know, came to redeem us. Um, but at the same time, that, that it's still a very difficult ask, I think, for some people to, to make that distinction, mm -hmm. to make that separation. Um, yeah, I think the, just to speak to your, the point that you made about our faith being sacramental, right. I think that's what's so beautiful about the faith in this work is that it's built into our very core belief that, uh, we seek atonement, reconciliation, that we are, um, are, are a people of faith who uh, believe that, you know, sin is something that we are constantly fighting against and that in many ways our church too is a human church and can sin and has sin um, and the representatives of that church have sin and yet we can seek atonement, we can uh, seek penance, and we can uh, seek reconciliation. Um, and so there's hope in that, in, in, in that, and that's, I think, rooted in the faith itself. And I, I want to draw back on something that you said before, not, not in this interview, but I've, I've heard you said, I think, in one of your presentations, um, you know, going back to 19, I think 87, it was uh, when Pope John Paul II came to the U.S. Uh, and he addressed uh, Native peoples. He was in, I believe, Arizona. Um, you know, he, he affirmed our dignity. He affirmed our identity. He affirmed that we are children of God. Um, many people will say he never quite got around to a formal apology. But in 2009... Uh, Pope Benedict XVI did go all the way uh, to make an apology. And now here we are in uh, 2022, uh, and, and we're, we're in the sort of the aftermath of Pope Francis' apology um, to the, the First Nations leaders who, who visited Rome. You said one time that there's, there's a lot of limitations that come with apologies. Um, they're, they're bound by space, they're bound by time, they're bound by the people who hear it. Um, and that's sort of the limitation because many people don't hear it. Or maybe wherever they may be in their healing process or, or even if they're not even there yet, maybe they're still in the confrontation process trying to sort through all the details. And so the, the apology, for them may not even be received. Um, what finite steps, and this is sort of a big ask, but beyond the apologies, beyond the, the grand gestures, the, the, the photo ops, um, what, what realistic finite steps can the church take, um, both, I would say, from Rome, but even on the local level, uh, 
to show that they're open, to show that that they're committed to this process and that they're not looking for a quick fix. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, I would agree uh, that apologies is finite. Um, I, I guess I would I would also say quickly too that um, I don't all I don't I always try to be careful not to like underestimate or undermine the importance of apology also at the same time, right? The apology really, really mattered, especially to those who needed to hear it. And, and certainly Pope Francis' apology also behaved in that way, that there were people who really, really needed that. And they heard it, and that was meaningful to them, and it mattered. Um, but yes, apology sort of lives and dies the moment it's uttered to the people who heard it. Um, and then afterwards, you know, it, it doesn't live necessarily beyond that, per se. Um, and there are people who will, won't have heard it. And, and you're right, there are people who are still in this confrontation phase in their own processing, who hear the apology and hear and, and, and don't receive it uh, because that they're still in a space of anger and the apology is too premature. Uh, in, in, and they, so, they, so they see it as insincere or um, because they're, they're still at this point where, and I think they're not wrong in, in many ways, the church still has a lot of confrontation to do. Um, uh, the, the work of confronting the history and, and being um, open about the history um, is a part of the truth and reconciliation process. There's a reason why truth comes first in, those, in that statement, um, because there's a lot of work to be done to uh, address the truth, um, to face the truth, um, and be open and transparent about uh, that truth. And so um, the work beyond apology is that work. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the letter that bishops Wall and Coakley wrote to all dioceses across the United States is a good example of that's the work, right? The work of dioceses engaging in relationship building with the tribes that they are uh, near and, and whose lands that they're on. Um, engaging in the work of truth telling around where were the boarding schools and 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 how many were there and and where did they exist when did they open when did they close which ones are still in operation today uh, maybe they're no longer boarding schools but but they have that history um, where are their archives where are their records what do those records say um, what was the experience of the people who lived that that uh, uh, that boarding school experience, that's the work um, beyond apology. Um, and I think that's the work that the church could engage more deeply in to show that it is moving beyond apology, um, that it is doing the work that the apology asks for um, and calls for. And, and Pope Francis himself said that in the apology that he made to the delegation of uh, First Nations peoples in Canada. Uh, he said that, I, I think, I don't, I'm not gonna get the quote exactly, but um, he said, you know, true, the work of reconciliation requires action. Um, and I think that is what um, the church is doing in different pockets, um, but, but could show a much more united front um, uh, in doing so and in, uh, engaging in this work of, of putting our, putting the apology where our mouth is, it's not the right expression, but you know, like sort of walking the walk um, and showing that we as a church are able to engage our past, um, are willing to do that um, because we're willing to admit that, that, that it, was a, it was a wrong um, and, and uh, be open to the possibility of what it might take to heal that wrong. Um, and we don't know what those are yet, right? Like we, we can't say what healing is yet. Um, and, and you know, I recently talked to a boarder who I think had a very profound statement of one of our local alumni who graduated from Holy Rosary Mission, which is the name of our school prior to becoming Red Cloud, mm -hmm. um, who said, there's no such thing as collective healing, right? You can't, you as a church, you as an institution can't, collectively heal anything, which is something we knew, um, but, but I appreciated the way she framed it because she said, 
Um, there's no such thing as collective healing. Everybody's healing is an individual journey. Everybody's healing is something that they have to do on their own. Um, and the only thing you can do is provide the things that people might need to achieve healing. And that could look lots of different ways. It could, it could be some, what some people need to open the door to healing is they need that acknowledgement from the church. They need that acknowledgement from the church that says, yes, this was wrong. And we admit that it was wrong. Um, and we, we, we believe you that the stories that you tell are true. Um, we believe that, that this, these bad things happened. That, that's an important first step in a, in a, a, a door we can open for people to begin healing. Um, yes, it might mean, you know, looking at all other possibilities that lead people toward healing. It might mean more than acknowledgement, of course. We can talk about things like, um, you know, opening of our records, and um, we could talk about things like, uh, you know, returning of land, right? There's all kinds of things that we can talk about, um, and that might help address some of that you know, latent need. Um, but it's all in our power to open those doors. That's something that the church can do. Um, and so that's what we need to start thinking about in terms of doing. Um, but it's always up to the individual in the healing process. And that, that actually is, I think, a powerful positive thing because it, it really promotes every individual's agency um, in, in, this, in this work. And I think that's an important thing um, to recognize. Well, Maka, we are in incredibly thankful um, that you, you time and time again um, are willing to share about the work that you do. Uh, I think the work that you're doing at Red Cloud is important in that it, I think it'll have echoes uh, throughout the Indian country. I think a lot of people, maybe even other schools, are going to see what's going on at Red Cloud and maybe want to sort of initiate their own process. Uh, so I want to commend you for that. But for our listeners and our viewers who are learning about you, and learning about the work at Red Cloud for the first time, uh, what are some ways that they can get involved? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I always encourage people to start local. Um, you know, uh, for people across the country who, are, who might be listening, um, I think some of the first questions that are important to ask is, do you know the Native people who are, uh, who, whose land you're, you're on? Um, do you know that history? Are you aware of the history? Do you know if there are boarding schools nearby where you are? Um, do you know, or, or do you know the, you know, can you find out where those people were sent? Um, can you just even start to begin to know the history of where, where, where you are and, and the peoples that, whose lives were impacted? Um, I think that's a first and foremost step for people to get involved, to start to learn, start to learn what, what the truth is of the peoples that you are connected to. Um, the diocese that you might be in and, and the, the peoples who were impacted in, in your area. Um, so it's, it's first and foremost important to start locally um, and, and just learn. Um, and then you can start to take more concrete steps um, once you, you learn that information. So you can um, support tribes in sort of uh, reaching out for that information support churches in being able to open that information if they have it um, and uh, start engaging in the, both the native Catholic community and also the uh, native uh, non-Catholic communities. But also, I mean, even for non-native Catholic communities, this is important to know, a lot of people don't know this. And so even just sharing this history, um, reading that article from Brett Salkeld um, and, learning about how we can approach this as a church and as a faith um, and trying to help other people understand. Well, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I think I think starting local sort of makes it real. I think it, it provides perspective for a lot of people. Uh, again, we want to thank you for, for joining us and for being a part of today's conversation. It's always a joy uh, to talk to you and to to hear about the work that you're doing. Uh, please be you know be aware that we, we are always praying for you. We are always praying for your community. 
and um, you know, we wish you all the support as, as this because I, I think I remember you saying one one time that this this is a journey that it, it may it may outlive you. You know, this this work will continue after Maka, you know, is, is no longer here, yeah. but it, it's a generational process. It is, it is a work that will take as long as it's going to take. We cannot put um, a timeline on this. It has to be organic. It has to be um, at the pace of the people, right? I mean, Absolutely. you said it yourself, there's no such thing as collective healing. And I think there's going to be a lot of variance in people's journeys. So, uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any final words or thoughts you'd like to share? Um, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate the uh, time and to hear and listen to the work that we're doing and 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 how it's unfolding. Um, just always appreciate the opportunity to share what we're what we're up to and how it's going. Uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, you want to do maybe five minutes just reflecting on the conversation? Sure, we can reflect. Okay. So, you want to reflect first, or you want me to reflect first? <laughs> you can reflect. You're very good at reflecting. Yeah, yeah, Father David. I'm okay at reflecting. Um, well, I, you know, I, every time I talk to Makar or, or, or see any of his presentations, I always think, yeah, I would love to have talked about five times longer, um, just because there's so much information that it, he's able to contribute, and he's such a he has such a great insight not only because he's both uh native and catholic but because he's very well rooted in both of those identities and very articulate very well uh um, researched and, and so forth you know one of the things that um i'd asked him at least um on one occasion um is a question it's an ongoing question that i have that that, that i've asked quite a few people and that is the the idea of the identity, like so, if if the boarding school era was designed to uh, to, for lack of a better word, I mean, there's no sugarcoating this, right? So it was cultural genocide, right? We're talking about assimilation. Don't speak your language. Don't do you know cultural things. Uh, you know, we want you to to walk like us, talk like us, dress like us, pray like us, be like us in every way. But it seems like. Um, you know, and for a lot of, and, and, that, and unfortunately that worked. And so for most Native people, their idea, their concepts of Christianity, especially Catholicism, is rooted in that, right? So right. to get away from that and get back to a point where we're saying, well, okay, this is about our pilgrim journey. We're all pilgrims. We're a pilgrim church. Um, we're neighbors now. Um, how can we, you know, make each other's lives better? How can we be better neighbors, as we said in the past? But as far as the church's response to the boarding schools, it seems that I think part of that should in include the conversation of how do we undo some of the damage that we did by maybe promoting language, by promoting like culture. Like I know one of the great things about Red Cloud that I've always been very impressed about Red Cloud Indian School is they do have a language uh, curriculum. They do have cultural curriculum and it's not taught by anthropologists or, or academics it's taught by native people from their communities coming in and passing down their culture and they do have uh, language classes and language you know and i think that's a, a really great thing it's it's kind of you know too late in a lot of cases to save languages but still i think there's got to be some part of the response on our end that puts an emphasis on saving and, and promoting those same things, which we were so unfortunately uh, very, very uh, adamant and eradicating and successfully um, eradicating in some cases. And the identity of a native person that, that says you can be native and be a Catholic without being a sellout or without abandoning your traditions or even your ceremonial traditions. I mean, you, you can walk in both worlds. Macaw is a great example of that. Um, but I think for most people, especially most Native people, especially those with that, that real anger against the church, there's the idea of you're either one or the other. And if you're one, if you're on the Christian side, then, then you're a sellout. And there has to be some way that we can 
pull back from such extremes um, in our uh, labeling, I guess, of each other and, and the idea that we can walk together and all share, you know, the same journey, I guess, you know. I mean, you're, you're exactly right. I think in the history of the church, um, the church has given the world no shortage of reasons to leave, to not be Catholic, right? Yeah. Um, I think, and, you know, it, and that's the human element. We've, we've had our foot in our mouths many times. We've, we've walked with two left feet. We've made mistakes. Um, and, you know, we go back to that scripture that, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But it's almost, uh, you almost can laugh at this point because it's, the church is, is going in spite of us, in spite of our mistakes, in spite of our error. Yeah. That, yeah. That's how you know that, that it's, a, it's a divine institution. It's a, it's a divinely created institution trusted by, right. entrusted to flawed, fragile, and often really incapable men. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you, when you speak with native people, um, you know, people have left the church for far, far lesser reasons. Yeah. So for those who choose to stay, for those who choose to be a part of the healing, um, you know, God bless them because that, I think it takes a really strong faith to, to, to keep moving forward. Absolutely. Definitely. I think one of the things that Demokha talked about, uh, both in this interview, but also in interviews he, he, he's done, is talking about, uh, yes, you have an apology, but the, what really uh, builds trust, not with, uh, of course, with natives, but everybody is to walk the walk, is to, you're constantly doing actions to that respond to your faith, and then people begin to trust you. If uh, you don't, then uh, that trust is very hard to get, get back especially with uh, many different Native communities that their trust has been violated so many times uh, that the trust is very hard to, to, uh, to uh, go back and to try to make strong and make whole again. So it's uh, the idea that we, we can't go back in the, the past. We can learn from that, learn from these powerful and stupid mistakes that people made to make sure that uh, they're not made again. One of the great aspects of the Calcanian Schools Network is their, uh, their work on... Uh, native uh, languages and especially teaching native languages not only languages but also culture yeah and the, the Catholic schools on reservations that's very important it's kind of the idea of learning from the past mistakes but it's also not not to uh, make uh, to uh, uh and Maka talked about this is to make sure that we do not minimize the pain and suffering that's been caused uh, our root sin back then and still is today is racism Racism caused the idea that we're Anglo uh, people, uh, nuns and, and priests and lay people have that uh, culture and thought their culture was superior and that they get that permission to annihilate other people's culture. And that's a sin. That's the evil that causes pain and suffering, a sin of, of racism. And the racism still exists today. Uh, so yeah. it's very important to understand that and to uh, be watchful. And that if racism appears, then we need to do something about it, or else we're going to go back and make these same mistakes that cause some pain and suffering uh, that generations will try to overcome from our own day. Uh, so again, it's important. First of all, yes, when we have sin and evil out there, it takes a lot of uh, good work and good effort from our own part uh, to make sure that we can reconcile our past mistakes and move on to the future. You know, I'm always glad when you... Uh say those things <laughs> because you say them very well um but you know in you in your response just now i have to say that it it, it arose uh within me a question that, that i've uh, been dealing with for quite some time and it really is in many ways a, a focus of a lot of the work that i do uh, um, with native issues and that is a lot of times the conversation is geared at what can we do or should we do for quotation fingers them right not very often do we have the conversation of what can we do or should we do about us. And you've hit on that quite, uh, quite a few times here. You know, it, the fact of the matter is, it wasn't just that there were some bad actors who made some terrible mistakes. Endemic in our thinking was that ingrained notion of superiority that you've mm -hmm. just talked about. It was a part of the way we thought. 
uh, we, we thought that we were doing them a favor, that we were going to save their souls by going uh, to such an extent, right? Because we had that ingrained superiority within us. And yeah, racism is very much a part of it. The idea that, you know, you've said this in past interviews, you know, the idea that, you know, European is somehow equal to divine, and it isn't. Um, so for us, the work that we need to do for us as Catholics, uh, Native or non-Native Catholics, what we need to do for Catholics is to help our own people to better understand and appreciate all people in the general sense, but in the United States and Canada, specifically Native First Nations people, um, as being, first of all, living, vibrant people, you know, they're not confined to some period in the past where, you know, they were on your John Wayne movies and now they're all dead or something, you know, as, but, but also, you know, as Catholics, and if we're really true about our faith, then we promote uh, the dignity of the human person as each person is created in the image and likeness of God at all times for all nations and all races and all peoples. And that means certainly in the United States, and I like what Makas said about get to know the natives that were in your area and the land that you're on. I took a, I took a youth group um, from here in our diocese. My diocese is a hundred percent of my diocese was Caddo uh, territory. Um, and I, and I took a youth group down to one of their burial mounds, which is only about an hour from where, um, my parish currently is and there's two uh there's a ceremonial mound and a burial mound down there that the Caddo um used and it dates back to about 800 AD roughly so I took the youth group down there and I talked to them and I said look this area this is what this area was like this is who inhabited this area this is what they lived like this is what they looked like this is what they this is their burial mound their ancestors are buried here I I, I think it's important for us to remember that we have a lot of work to do within our own communities as Catholics and, and to fix our mentality uh, to, get, to eradicate that, that, that feeling of superiority, certainly. Yeah, very, very well put. Um, and I think, I think the church as a whole is in a very uh, formative moment right now, um, just in conversations that I've had recently. Um, we're waking up to the fact that that all cultures um, have their own expression of the faith and have their own way of, of approaching God and that the Catholic Church is a place for, for all of us. It's not a place for, for one culture to, to have prominence over the others. Um, I, I think as a church, we're sort of in that, that growth moment right now, that moment of realization. Um, and so for not just, you know, the Native communities, but for many cultural uh, families, um, I think they're going to become more bold in, in how they express the faith uh, that, that's reflective of their, of their patrimony. So. Name the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Bless you, Lord, our God. We ask sin down the Holy Spirit upon all of us, especially during this Easter season. We're always mindful of your resurrection as a, a way for our own resurrection to take place. We ask a special blessing upon the work of Makah uh, uh, Black Elk and his uh, growing uh, concern throughout the country of the need for healing and reconciliation uh, to uh, the tribes in the United States and also uh, in Canada, uh, always be with him and to help him and direct him in his life and bless his family, bless our families. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.